Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back again with a fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before we get into just an amazing guest uh, this week, referred by another buddy, Kevin Richardson, I just wanted to drop a line once again to remind everybody to go in and listen to more of these amazing podcasts. You want to tune in at www.markpattersonnfl.com. I've now done around 200 of these, and uh, they continue to amaze me, inspire me, and drive me in terms of continuing to, to get up and make it happen and find these different inspirational people like we'll get into later today. Also, as I continue to remind people, um, I will be heading off to Mount Everest this next March, trying to become the first NFL player to climb the seven summits, including taking on Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain, all within 24 hours. It should be an epic battle, and an epic challenge. Um, you can follow my journey through there. There's also going to be a Garmin uh, plug-in, which uh, you can actually follow me going up and down the mountain. So that's cool. So tune in on that. And last, I continue to fundraise for a cause called Amelia's Everest Delotzi Challenge. My daughter does have epilepsy. I've connected with a, a fantastic organization here in Sun Valley, Los Angeles, and New York called Higher Ground. And together, we're trying to, again, bring more money and awareness and hopefully that all people with PS, uh, PTSD, epilepsy, and other cognitive issues will be healed one of, of these days. Okay, so it's not that often that I actually get the one and only Hercules on the pod. I'm very stoked up to have this guy. He's my uh, second actor in, I think, second weeks. So I had Tom Arnold on, on this last week. But I want to welcome to the pod Kevin Serbo. Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. That's uh, it's good to be here, and uh, you're in the area that I've I've spent plenty of time in summers as well at the charity events for golf and uh, skied there a few times as well. So I love that Sun Valley area. Yeah, Sun Valley is amazing, and I've actually been to West Palm Beach, Florida, where where you're uh, currently residing. You know, it's interesting. You've had this this long storied career in in Hollywood, and I'm I'm always curious on you know that path because. You know, especially when you find somebody that grows up in a teeny tiny town in the middle of Minnesota and, you know, what those connection pieces were. Like one day you wake up and, you you know, and you look at you know, on, the, on television and you look at the movies and, and you aspire to be, I don't know if it was John Wayne or who your, your mentor was, but there's some bug that hits you. And, you know, you really got to start thinking big in terms of how you're actually going to get there. So how did that all come together for you? Yeah, I, I grew up in a really small town called Mound of Minnesota. It's on the western shore of uh, beautiful Lake Minnetonka, about 25 miles west of Minneapolis. And uh, fourth of five kids. My dad was a school teacher. My mom was a nurse, but pretty much a stay-at-home mom since she had five kids so quick in her life. And, uh, you know, I was 11 years old, and we went to the uh, Guthrie Theater. It's a very famous theater in Minneapolis. A lot of, a lot of Broadway plays start there before they moved to New York. And it was The Merchant of Venice. It was a Shakespeare play. I didn't know what the heck they were saying because it was Shakespeare. But uh, I was mesmerized by the actors on stage. And on the way home, I told my mom, I said, you know what, I'm going to be an actor. And uh, she said, that's nice, dear. A little pat in the leg. Uh -huh. And I kind of kept to myself because I was a jock. Grew up playing football, basketball, baseball. And, um, you know, we kind of make fun of the people in the drama classes, drama departments. But I kept saying, but the best looking girls are on the drama class, guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> so... Um, I really, really didn't start going after it until I got into college. Um, I got double major business, marketing, advertising, but took a minor in drama and uh, started doing a lot of commercials. Minneapolis is home to a lot of big uh, companies. I don't think people realize they got Best Buy there. They got uh, 3M. They got Honeywell, Pillsbury, uh, General Mills. So there's a lot of commercials. Target, all those things are headquartered there. So I got that all-important Screen Actors Guild card before I made the big move out to Los Angeles. But uh, I had a few sidetracks in there along the way i ended up in dallas for a while i had buddies playing football down there at smu that i went to high school with and and then i traveled uh, over to europe it was going to be three months turned into three and a half years and i signed with agents over there and did a lot of print work a lot of commercial work in milan and, and paris and munich and uh, had a, it, it made me grow up I, I i didn't think i'd spend that much time there my parents kept going aren't you going to go to la so i finally get to la to kind of pursue that dream but that that goal was set in me early in life. And I, I, I kind of focused on it ever since I was 11 years old. Yeah, well, lucky you and congratulations. And a lot of it can get down to perseverance and, and luck mm. and break and all those things. And I say all the time, preparation meets opportunity. You know, sure. you're, I think it's one thing to be able to go out and to 
want to act and you, so you find the local theater or something and that's kind of the purest form and that's awesome. But at the end of the day, it's how you monetize your life. And now you're married to a beautiful gal and actress and you've got three kids yeah. and you know, you really want to keep that thing alive. And so you need some breaks beyond just a couple of luck and good lucks because we all age and you get older. And at some point in time, you know, you can't model, you know, the rest of your life or maybe some can, but you know, we really start to make a mark and you certainly did. You've been in over 40 films. And, and, you know, 64, this, 64 to be exact, 64 to be exact. Thank you for, <laughs> for that update. Um, 64 to be exact and a bunch of TV stuff. And certainly you had uh, a big career with, with uh, any series that goes six years, more than one, you know, is really amazing with Hercules, but you know, th this story is so much more than that. And that's the reason why I wanted to have you on, I, you know, as a former NFL player, especially when I was originally drafted by the, the Raiders in LA, we had famous people coming around our, our facility all the time. So that's been nothing, you know, new to me, but it's really the depth of a person and really, you know, what their story is and how they got there. And that's where it really, I feel like there's a connection in terms of your story on how you got there. And, and so I'll let you tell it. Um, and and there, there's another connection piece, which I'll get into in just a minute, but you had a gigantic health scare and I want you to describe that to me, Kevin, but I also want to understand like when you, when you came out of that, right, what were the learning pieces? Were, was there a lot of times when people are in, in, in peril, they're sitting there like, oh my God, you know, if you can just get me out of this, I'm at sea for 180 days, you know, and I've gone through, like I said, almost 200 podcasts and I've had just amazing people, you know, no arms, no legs, flying, going down the Grand Canyon, climbing Mount Everest, all these crazy stories. And all of them had to overcome this, this, this something. And so for you, would you please describe what happened to you? And then let's go to the bigger picture of, of life. You know, how that really made you focus in on, on your faith, because I know that's strong, your kids, your family, your wife, those things. Well, it's, uh, it was at, uh, when I got Hercules, I ended up down in New Zealand. By our third year, that series became the most watched TV show in the world in 176 countries. Um, I was just starting to do, um, I did my first big budget motion picture called Call the Conqueror. Uh, my movie career was really starting to take off because of that series. Uh, at the end of season five on, Her on, on Herc, I was having all kinds of problems with my left shoulder. Couldn't quite figure what was going on. And these three fingers in his hand were numb and cold. And it was just, it was just weird. But I was blown it off because, you know, I was, I was working 12 to 14 hours a day. I was lifting weights two hours a day. You know, it's like back then when you're younger, you know, I was, I was 225, 230. I was in ripped up. I was in better shape in my 30s than I probably was in my 20s. And uh, I was doing all my own stunts because my ego said that I could. And um, I went back to the States to do promotional work on my first movie called The Conqueror. And then I went to see my doctor in L.A. and said, God, something's going on here. I don't know what is going on. They on a lump way up here in my left subclavicle. He wanted to do a biopsy on it. Before they could do the biopsy, I went to see my chiropractor. Now, in eight years of seeing this guy, who's based in Santa Monica, um, he's never cracked my neck because I don't like my neck cracked. He can crack it into my body, but leave my neck alone. It's scary, well, by the way. It's scary. It's scary, by the way, too. Somebody go blah, 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 whack, right? Yeah. I mean, I feel like always my neck's going to fall off. I know. So I never have, I mean, has it, has it happened before? Yeah. And I never liked it. So this guy knew that. And a voice in my head warns me, don't let him crack your neck over and over again. And I'm going, why am, I, why am I getting this don't let him crack your neck? He's never cracked my neck. So while I'm arguing with the voice, he cracks my neck. Well, that lump here ended up being an aneurysm that had been spitting blood clots down on my arm. And that vicious crack knocked a series of strokes into my brain. And I spent the next four months learning how to walk and balance again. It took me three years to fully recover from it. It was, uh, it was you know... It, you know, it's like when you step out of the limelight that way and you think, you, you know, I, I wasn't a pro athlete, but I, I, I felt like I was a good athlete in great shape. And all of a sudden I'm playing this guy Hercules and I can't even stand up and walk and I'm in a rehab center with 90 year old stroke victims. And it was tough on my ego. It was tough on my psyche. It was tough on my my body. I mean, it was it was just brutal for me to get through this thing. And um you know, I wrestled with God. I wrestled, you know, you, when things happen like this in life, we tend to blame everybody else but ourselves. And my wife at the time, we weren't married um, at the time, but she she said, every time I got down, she said, it happened. What are you going to do? And thank God to my upbringing with my parents, who are very strong-willed people and taught us all about self-reliance, made me a very strong individual, made me a very motivated individual. I did 10 times more than what the neurologists were telling me to do to get recover, recovery. And they said after a year... Wherever you are after a year, you're probably going to live with that the rest of your life. Well, after a year, I still wasn't doing that great. 
And so I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Like I said, it took three full years. My wife bugged me for the longest time to write a book. And I didn't want to write the book. But finally, uh, years later, I did write it back in 2012. Um, and here's the book right here. And it's called True Strength, My Journey from Hercules to Mere Mortal and How Nearly Dying Saved My Life. And I call it True, Str True Strength because in Hercules, that was a television show, right? I mean, I had a bunch of stunt guys making me look like a big stud. And the reality is I'd rely on my own self. And I've always had a bit been a person of faith, but I never needed faith until this, this roadblock hit me. And the reason this book has been such a, a wonderful thing for me, uh, just for therapy, I guess, um, it's been so amazing for other people that have read it because whether it's cancer, a car crash, heart attack, stroke, whatever it may be, we're all going to hit that roadblock in our life. I don't care what age you are, or what your physical fitness is or what it's not. What do you do when you hit that roadblock? How do you react to it? Do you blame the world? Do you blame God, family and friends? Or do you look in the mirror and say, OK, I'm going to beat this thing. I'm going to push myself and push myself. So I tell people you got to find your own true strength within yourself to push past and find a different avenue to go in your life. Otherwise, you're only going to, it's just, it's just the life's just going to get darker for you. And I don't want to have a dark life in, in my 30s. So, yeah, I mean, look, the, the, it, it's a tough thing when you think you're invincible. You're literally yeah. Hercules. And, and uh, I've seen the pictures. I saw the show back in the day. You're all yoked up. And, and, uh, and then you have this thing come and really knock you on your knees. And then, you know, what do you do about it? You know, how are you going to respond? The, the, the correlation I wanted to to quickly share with you is that my dad, who's no longer with us, passed away six years years ago. He was the life of the party, just mm -hmm. a uh, just an incredible communicator, incredible person, great mentor for me. Had a massive stroke, and it just literally knocked out his whole communication grid. And with that, um, you know, the first month was just trying to understand what happened. Month two, it's just like, okay, maybe there's hope. And month three is like, this is not going to happen, right? Like you said, there was so much blockage and everything. And then, and and at the end of the day, for him, and we had talked about this, you know, a lot in 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 our past history, which is, you know, if either one of us were ever in that position, you know, we just want to you know, move on to a better life, right? My dad was a guy of faith. And so it was very, very blessed and fortunate and grateful that, um, you know, he flew away to heaven and, and that's where he resides, you know, today. So that meant a lot to me, but I went through that whole thing and I know how scary that is, not just for you, but everybody around you who, who, you know, that either relies on you or you have a relationship, whether it's your wife or your kids or girlfriend or whatever that, that path is your parents. And it is hard, man. And you just don't know because it's a brain issue, right? Blockage. Okay. And, you know, what that is going to be. One of the things that you, 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 you said, I want to dive down a little further in this, which is you, you talked about it was, it was therapeutic in terms of being able to write this, this book, True Strength. And, and, and then you quickly transition because everybody else in life is going to go through something at some point in time. And I've experienced that. That's why I'm climbing mountains. That's why I'm doing this podcast is because I went through my, you know, my trials and tribulations. And out of that, I've, I've emerged, you know, doing this other stuff. I, I had to do a pivot. But I also know that when I was on the mountains, for me, I've done a ton of writing um, about my journey and how I got there and all this stuff. And, and for you, I know you said it was therapeutic and you kind of equated that to where other people can relate to that. But for you, when you had to really peel back the layers, is there one thing that stood out or two things or three things that like you had to improve yourself or make a lifestyle change? Or was there any nuance in there as you're like, you know, really trying to like understand why this happened to you? Well, I was, I mean, I was forced to make a lifestyle change, obviously. I mean, it, 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 it sucked. I mean, I, I'll tell you, for two years, I had vertigo. And it didn't matter if I was laying down, seated, or standing up. I was always falling back. You know, I get, you get that jerk sometimes, like you're falling back. I had that sensation almost 24 hours a day. During this halfway through the second year of my recovery, there would be like a week window where I didn't feel that more anymore. I tell my wife that, and she goes, "See, you're getting better," and that gave me hope. Four months after the strokes, I actually went back down to New Zealand to start season six on the series. And not that Universal Studios cared about me as a person, but they cared the fact that this was a big money maker for them. But I'll tell you what, I don't care what their motiv motivations were. For me, it gave me light at the very now, the end of a very long and dark tunnel for me, even though I, I, I went from a 14 hour day to one hour a day, those first couple months in two hours, they slowly added things. They had to make a crutch. We made fun of it. It's called a butt crutch. 
I'm six three, but I would sit on this thing, get down about six one, and would have me look like I'm still standing just to do scenes. And I would do I would do like one or two scenes a day where they would just sort of have me say my lines and I'd cut around things and they have the other actors saying later after I left sex, they couldn't deal with it because the dizziness and the and I had, I suffered panic anxiety attacks, things that I never had before. So uh, my wife gave me something that she said, every morning, I want you to wake up and look in the mirror and say out loud, I'm getting better, I'm getting stronger. And as corny as that sounded, that was so huge for me to talk to myself and say, I'm getting better, I'm getting stronger and keep saying it, keep saying it. And it helped motivate me for the day to just get out and walk. I mean, we started during those four months, we, we when I was slowly trying to get my trying to get my balance back, we would just take walks and just to walk a half a block and then back to the house again was a small little victory for me. And I would keep a chart. OK, I took this much more, many more steps today just to know that I, I was gaining on this. And I looked at this and trained like like an athlete would when I when I used to play sports. So it, it, it was huge for me to say that mantra over and over again. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I didn't, I never would have admitted this. It's in the book, but I went to see a shrink. My wife wanted me to see a shrink. And he said to me, he goes, he said, you thought you were Superman. You thought you're Hercules. I said, no, I didn't. Yeah, you did. And because your life was going so great, the universe was gearing up to take over for Arnold as the next action guy. And they were, I just had finished one big action movie, had another one I was going to do, but then the strokes hit. So he said, you had a lightning bolt hit that and shatter everything in your life. And now you'll never be the same person again, Kevin. you got to create the new Kevin. Because I know I'll never be, I know I'll never be that same person again. And I knew, well, I know what my limitations are, even though I don't, I don't want to set my limitations. I don't want anyone to set the limitations. So um, I knew I couldn't do certain things anymore. So, but I said, but I can do this now. And I can do something, you know, it, it was it was an interesting transition for me to, become a different Kevin Sorbo, which is weird for me to have to even say that. But the studio worked with me. Um, I got another series right after that. And each year I just got stronger and stronger. I passed all the physical exams that were thrown at me and given to me. I still have, uh, if I get overly tired, I have balance issues. Um, I'm, if I'm going to drink, I'm going to have one glass of wine. That's it, because mm -hmm. that affects me more in my brain. But the best thing about doing this book, True Strength, is really it's open up speaking events to me that I thought I'd never be doing. COVID killed them this year at about eight speaking events I was supposed to do. But I've been averaging, you know, 10 to 12 speaking events a year where I travel the country or up to Canada as well. And I speak whether it's a, a medical uh, place where I'm speaking to neurologists or nurses or if I'm speaking in a church or something. That's It's a road that I never thought I'd be on. And I'm, it's really been fascinating to me. And, um, I, you know, I, I can't. I, I could complain, but it doesn't, it doesn't do any good. But I like the road that I'm on now, and I like the movies I'm doing now. I do a lot of fa family-friendly, faith-based movies. And uh, I don't think anything would, would have been happening for me had it not been for me to go through what I had to go through. Yeah, it's always interesting because a lot of times, like, like you said, we do go through these challenging periods in time in our life. And, and, and when you're in the thick of things, you know, the only thing you can do is go through it. You can't go around it. And and And... And having that tenacity and knowing and coming to grips with if you can get to the other side with positivity mm -hmm. and you know there's gonna be struggle, there's something greater that's gotta that's gonna come for you. And and you may not know it for five, 10, 15 years, no. but and you, you know, we wish you had the answer, you know, in that instant. You know, I, I'm gonna say one thing that this 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 psychologist said for me, which I really liked. He said, "Are you are you a, a man of faith?" And I said, "Well, I am." He goes, "Well, you don't have to be for what I'm gonna to say to you, but it doesn't hurt." He said, "Have you ever heard of the Grateful Prayer?" And I said, "Well, I know what prayers, no, but have you ever heard of the Grateful Prayer?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, here's why you don't have to be a man of faith to even say the Grateful Prayer, but you can be sitting in your car, sitting in your office." jogging, walking a mountain, whatever. And you can say, you know, I'm grateful the sun's out today. I'm grateful I have a pillow. I'm grateful I have hot water. We get so caught up in our own lives. Look at all the anger we have in this world right now, and the, the divisiveness and the hatred and the violence going on. Even in your home city of Seattle, you see all the stuff going on with these Antifa punks, you know, and it's unbelievable that they're just destroying people's businesses and destroying lives. And there's so much hate. And I'm trying to go, you know what, how do we find a place where we can just help people that must be so, so dark in their own lives that they have to turn to that kind of violence, that kind of anger and hatred. You kind of wonder what their lives must be like. And we got to find a place where we're grateful because there's a lot of things to be grateful for no matter where 
where you are in your life, no matter where your economic world is or, you know, where your job is or your family situation or lack of or whatever, there's places you can still find uh, uh, pockets of gratefulness. Totally agree with you. And, you know, look, not one person can always change the world because people come from different viewpoints. But I just I really I really believe that walking the walk, talking the talk and, and being the type of person that doesn't blame others doesn't lash out, listens, but you got to start with yourself, man. You got to start with really understanding who you are, what you're about and making sure that you're, you truly are grateful, um, humble and kind about the different things that you have in your life. And there's, everybody has them. And there's a lot of little, little secrets, in my opinion, about positive affirmations and positive voices and those words you were talking about, you know, to help you to get there. I want to ask you really quickly about, um, I think, part of this journey is making sure that you have the right people around you as well, mm -hmm. right? Because the wrong people can pull you down. The right people can pull you up, right? You used to live in LA and uh, you now- Right there in, just, right there in Santa Monica. So I, right used to down, I used to bike down your way all the time, Manhattan Beach. I, my, my, yeah, well, I was living in Santa Monica too. I was north of okay. uh, Montana there for five, five or six years. And, and uh, so I'm sure we're in the same hood there. But, you know, I, I, I'm curious- in terms of now you live on the East coast, you're in Florida and, and this connection you've had with, with your wife, family, and in your kids, again, do you think that through life, through experiences, through maturity, through faith, through those types of things that, you know, those, you know, you put those things all into a magic crystal ball and those have been the ingredients to help push you and elevate you in this, especially in, in your world, you know, you're, you're, you're now taking more charge of your career, which is awesome, but you're still kind of waiting a lot of times for the next gig and the next gig and the next gig. And you need to have that support system in place when you're in the acting world. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the wife, my wife was a key element of that. As I told you, we weren't married yet when I suffered the strokes, but she stuck by my side. I even told her, I said, look, I don't know what, uh, if I'm going to be worth anything with these strokes. I don't know what I'll be able to do. And she stuck by my side and we still got married and we got three kids, wonderful kids. I got three, uh, two boys, 19 and 16, a beautiful daughter at 15. We homeschooled. Um, I should say she does the homeschooling. She, is the, <laughs> she was the biochemical engineering major at Duke and speaks five languages. I went to college for, to play sports and to, uh, you know, go to happy hour with my buddies. So yeah, yeah. We, went to school, we went to schools for a completely different reason. Dude, I, I can, but, yeah, I can understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I just, um, you know, you know, the support I had there, the support I had for my parents, and certainly my faith had a big uh, role in this as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, without that, you need that. You need those people in your lives to sit there and, and help push you. And the interesting thing, what you just said, is it's easy to be around people that can pull you down too. And I had that in LA. I had that. And the minute I got rid of those people, the minute I got rid of people, I said, why do I want to hang with that person and this person? They're just, it just dragging me down. I started working more. I was focused more. I started getting more jobs, more guest spots. Um, it led to, you know, the, the Hercules thing happened. I know it did because I had a better focus. And I had, I just wanted positive people in my life because there's just no reason to hang around people that want to keep pulling you down because misery loves company. There's a reason that statement is so true. So uh, the more success I had, the people in my life uh, that were downers, they started just peeling away on their own because, you know, they don't want to be around me because I was having success and they weren't. No. Uh, we'll transition a little bit into your movie life. Now, one of the, one of the movies that I really identified that you were in, I thought you, you were fantastic is soul surfer. And one of the reasons I have two daughters, one 22 mm -hmm. and one 24. And, you know, just because we're so heartfelt, the girl that gets attacked by a shark and you, no. you know, play the scene of rushing her back to the hospital from that bay. Uh, what was that movie like? Carrie Underwood, Dennis Quaid. You had some big stars in that movie, being on Hawaii. What was that like? I'm um, great. Helen Hunt's in the movie as well. Anna Sophia Robb played Bethany. They cut out two of my best scenes. I wasn't happy about that. I had a great emotional scene with, with Helen Hunt, a great emotional scene with Dennis. But they took him out of the movie because of time element, um, which really was a bummer for me. But, you know, we had two months in Hawaii where we shot. Bethany was on set every day. And uh, I remember we went to, we shot most of the North Shore of Oahu and Turtle Bay. Then we shot, we take a small crew to the North Shore of Kauai, where Bethany lives and where the, it actually happened. 
And uh, we were 400 meters offshore. We're in the same spot that she was attacked. I remember all of us actors. I had the two actors playing my son and daughter. And then, of course, Anna Sophia Roth playing Bethany. And we're sitting on our boards while the camera guys are setting up. And, you know, we're sitting there. We're dangling our feet in the water. And no one is talking. I finally said, you know, I know we're not saying nothing, but we're all thinking about it right now. <laughs> because you're just you're out there 400, you know, four football fields from shore. Yeah. Oh man, but it was it was an amazing experience to be part of that. And Bethany was boy, what a champ the whole time there. And she and I brought the movie to the uh, Cannes Film Festival, and we did so many interviews while they screened it there. And she said to me, Kevin, I don't want they're going to ask questions to me about the attack. I'm done talking about the attack, so let's do our, our interview separately, and you handle that part of it because you know just as well as I do, other, other than feeling the pain. Um, and I said, fine, I got it. I get it. She doesn't want to relive it over and over again with these people. You know, she wanted to talk more about other things, but uh, uh, it was a fun experience, no question. Yeah, there's another guy I had on, it seems like 150 episodes ago, Mike Kutz, and he's a guy that was from Kauai, he's buddies with Bethany. He mm-hmm. also got attacked and this, 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 this big tiger shark emerged from underneath like wow. a flipping submarine and came up and just like engulfed him. And, and as he was trying to fight this shark off, he's hitting him in the, in the snout and he finally releases him in his buddy's next. He wasn't surfing. He was uh, boogie boarding and his buddy next to him, of course, is in horror and there's blood everywhere. And so he just happened to be able to catch a wave, the next wave that took him all the way in the shore and his life was saved. But Anyways, just uh, another incredible tale of, of how these things all played out. That was an amazing movie. I want to fast forward. I know there's 64, 65 movies that you've done and a lot of stuff. We don't have to go through all of them, but um, I want to t- talk to you more about one of the They're not all good, but most of them are. But anyway. No, but like you're doing stuff today, right? You have yeah. a movie coming out. I'm looking behind you. You've got the big uh, Miracle in East Texas. Let's talk about that. Um, it's the uh, last one I directed. Um, we dr- shot it last year up in Canada. Wonderful film. It's a wonderful movie. And um, it, uh, it's a true story set in 1930. And it's got uh, John Ratzenberg is in it and Lou Gossett Jr. is in it. Tyler Maine. People know him from the WWF, but they also know him from uh, uh, his uh, Sabretooth and the X-Men movies. My wife, Sam, is in it. She's amazing in it. It was supposed to be out this summer, but obviously COVID killed, you know, theaters opening up. But you know what? I don't want COVID-20. We're going to get back to having normal lives again. We're opening movie theaters. We're going to walk around and actually see people's faces and smile and laugh and say hello. But that'll come out uh, probably next spring. It's a wonderful movie set in 1930 about two con men played by myself and John Ratzenberger that would woo widows out of their money on fake oil wells through Oklahoma and Texas. True story. And um, they accidentally strike oil. And uh, it's it's a it's a very, very amazing movie to be part of. I was blessed to direct it. The great uh, Dan Gordon uh, wrote it. He wrote uh, The Hurricane, Denzel Washington, Rob Whiter, Kevin Costner. He, he was the showrunner in Highwood Heaven with Michael Landon, wrote 60 of those episodes. So that will come out sometime next spring. But I do want to back up a little bit because you brought in Soul Surfer. But I hope people have also seen What If? God's Not Dead, and my other movie, Let There Be Light. Those well, are all out there right now. I, actually, I was just going to go to ask you about What If, and I'm actually going to watch that tonight. So tell me about What If. What If was really my first, I guess you could say, uh, faith-based movie. Uh, Dallas Jenkins is a friend of mine. Dallas's father is Jerry Jenkins, who wrote all the Left Behind books. And uh, Dallas showed it to me, the script. And he said, what do you think of the script? So I read it, called him the next morning. I said, well, who's playing Pastor Ben in the movie? He says, ah, I got maybe this guy, this guy. I said, no, no, I'm playing it. He goes, no, I, I can't afford you. This is such a low budget movie. And I said, I don't care. I got to play this guy. It's such a great movie. And um, it had a small theatrical release. A couple years later, I did God's Not Dead. Same writers that did What If. God's Not Dead just exploded. You can't explain why sometimes these small independent movies do what they do. Great movie. But a little $2 million movie making $140 million is unbelievable. What if it's a better movie? And it deserves people. It deserves, I, I think we should re, uh, re-release it again because it is such a good movie. And uh, John Rathenberg plays this angel that comes from heaven to say, God's given you a what if. So it's a revor- reverse. It's a wonderful life. He said, you know, the road you're on is the wrong road. You were intended for this road. Trouble is, I like the road I'm on, but I have no choice but to see what this other road is. And, uh, you know, there's always an opportunity cost no matter what we do. We all have what ifs in our lives. 
and uh, you know turn a different corner and you if something else could have happened right sometimes you take a left when you should have taken a right that happens every day in life there's always choices we make so it's an interesting movie it's like a reverse it's a wonderful life but it's very touching it's very funny you you will laugh you'll cry you'll cheer but it's a uh, Chrissy Swanson in, is in it as well and she's she's just great in it but it was a lot of fun I recommend that movie highly so with, with what's going on right now with, with COVID, which today we're talking on October 25th, right? This will come out right. in a couple of weeks. And, and everybody, that you know, the movie theaters all, have all been shut down more or less. And, yep. and so there's all this streaming. You know, if you're an investor in Netflix or some of these other ones, you know, it's gone gangbusters. In terms of a lot of these movies, um, is, is there a strategy when you are a part of this? You know, you're the producer, you're the director. In terms of you're going to go down the prime Amazon route, or you're going to go the Netflix route, or you're going to go the Hulu route. How does that all come together? Well, I, I I want my movies to get out theatrically. That makes a big difference for an independent movie. I mean, right now the limited theatrical uh, releases out there are all big Hollywood movies, and they're taking up all all the screens, and it's hard to compete. You know, I do movies. I call them actors' movies. I call them movies that people can relate to. We don't have big visual effects. It's not, you know, I do movies where you're dealing with real people. Where I want people to identify. We can't identify with Thor and Superman. We can enjoy it and look at the special effects. But the reality is I want to do movies that made me want to be an actor in the first place to make people look at these movies and think, you know, real life situations where people go, wow, yeah, I can I can identify that guy with a guy or I know a woman like that, whatever it may be. So uh, if you get the theatrical release is very important for the streaming that comes afterwards. Like we got a really good uh, contract with Amazon with my last movie, Let There Be Light. Now, Let There Be Light was in theater. Sean Hannity funded that. And uh, it's a wonderful, touching movie. More, It's more about hope, redemption, love and things like that. The things that we need more in our world right now. And uh, Amazon saw how well it did in theaters and gave us a great three year deal. So to get that, they both, Netflix and Amazon both want this movie back here, Miracle in East Texas, but they want to see what the numbers look like in theaters first. That's why I'm holding on to it. I mean, it's a 1930 movie. I mean, it's so it's it's timeless in a way. It's not going to age. It's not going to, it'll be ready to go uh, this spring and summer. So we'll release it then and see what, uh, what kind of battle we can get with Amazon, Netflix, and even Hulu. We'll see what happens. It, it, it's really, I don't know anything about this world, your, your world that I'm talking about. Um, but it, it, what I'm hearing is that it's very strategic, right? Yeah. In terms of who's in it and what kind of playtime it gets and timing and all those other things. Like you said, there's a movie in there that, that cost $2 million to do and it made 186 million. You know, who, who knew that would actually happen? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Well, the investor was his first time investing. And I told him, I said, Troy, you don't understand. It's not usually this easy for any movie. Uh, you, what happened to you was like one baseball team getting two grand slams in one inning. Seriously, yeah. it's, it's that rare that happened. But, you know, these movies, these independent movies are getting better and better. The scripts are great. And a lot of actors from all levels want to be in these movies now because they're good movies. I mean, I like a good visual effect movie, too. But, you know, after a while, it's like, going, OK, another 18 buildings in New York City fell down. They they saved the world, but three million people just died in New York. They don't talk about that part. of yeah, You yeah. see the destruction going on. So um, I'm, I'm you know, my plan is to keep doing more of these. I'm about to be in the Reagan movie, Dennis Quaid. I'm, wor- I'm yeah. working with Dennis again. He's playing Ronald Reagan. I'm playing his pastor. I just got funded for my next movie, uh, the next Left Behind movie. I'm doing that one. I got two movies I'm shooting up in uh, Kelowna, up there north uh, northeast yeah. of uh, Vancouver. Yeah. So uh, it's you know I, it's it's busy. I just finished shooting eight episodes of a new half hour uh, comedy back in L.A. So that'll be out uh, next year as well. So you know things things are still buzzing. I'm still making things happen, which is good. What what do you love most about it? I love being on the set. I love the creative process. I just do. Yeah, I mean, so much about these podcasts are about talking to guys like you and others and the inspiration that people can get. And really, at the end of the day, it's all really not only trying to help people overcoming whatever they're going through, but ultimately finding out your, your why and your passion and what mm-hmm. you really have that drive for in life. And to get excited, you know, wake up every flipping day and just get jacked up about you've got this opportunity, you know, you just rattle off two or three or four or five or six or seven. I'm not sure how many movies and projects that you have going on. I mean, it's so awesome that you're able to do that, but somebody could be a painter or somebody could be, I work at sports illustrate, you know, there's, there's all these different things that people can do, but you have to get up and you have to get after it and you have to try and you have to apply discipline to it. And, you know, you got to have positive people around. There's a whole list of things that have to be in that box that have to be checked off. 
to continue to elevate in your life on whatever you want to do. And it sounds like, you know, you've been on the path for, for a long time. And the other thing I really love about what you're, what you're doing is this, this, these are your words. I'm sure there's an actual name for it, but it, you know, there's faith based films. And really to me, what that means, it doesn't matter if you're, you're, you, you believe in God or, or, or whatever your religious belief is, but it's just good people doing good things with positive outcomes and not, like you said, 3 million people blowing up because a building collapsed, you know, in New York, you know, it's crazy. So positivity, we need a lot more of that stuff around the world. Well, I mean, no, I've been lucky in, in the industry because uh, I, I'm one of few people I know that when I moved to Los Angeles to pursue this dream, I didn't know per, one person out there. I never had to work another job. I know guys are selling cars, they're working in bars and restaurants, whatever it may be. I work very well commercially. I was getting guest spots here and there and Cheers, Murder, She Wrote, The Commission, whatever. I kept busy. I got myself in the toughest acting classes because I wanted to be, oh, that's hard to get in that class. You got to audition. I said, great, that's where I want to go. And I think that's what you have to do is not be afraid of, of, of have that failure that I used to caddy at this private country club in Minneapolis and we didn't have any money. My dad was a school teacher for crying out loud, public school teacher with five kids, but I never felt without because my parents were always very good and strong parents were motivational parents. And, um, I asked these guys, how did you become successful? And every single one of these guys said, I failed Kevin and I failed again. And then I failed some more. And failure, you have to find out, is a positive thing, not a negative thing, because you're going to learn a lot from those things. You can get rid of uh, the, some of the failure. You just say, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. But some of this I can take with me and learn. So people, you know, I think a lot of people give up on their dreams and they give up on that goal and they and they, they become miserable in their lives. Find something to love to do. I'm in an industry that is tough as hell. It's tough to get a job. Everybody's out there. Everybody in L.A., you're out there playing football. I mean, everybody is, is an actor. And uh, to me, it was just like, okay, I'm going to make it though. I mean, I, I was, I was determined in my mind that I was going to make it. And I went out there with a single goal in mind. And the best advice I got from a dear buddy of mine I've known since, you know, two years old, still friends to this day. He said, remember Sorbs, it's called show business, not show show. And I always remember that they treat it like a business. Yeah, no, that's, that's wise. <laughs> <laughs> and that should also help motivate and drive people in terms of what they're there to do and not, you know, I think too many people get hung up on, you know, being recognized and all this nonsense, you know, when they walk into a restaurant and that's not what it's about at all. Right. And the sooner no. you get over that, the better. Do you have in, in kind of rounding through base here, do you have, this is the fun part of what you do. Maybe you might not think it's fun, but I think it's fun <laughs> when, when, you know, when, when you, when you do a movie, and now you go and you, you hit the circuit, right? And now you're going on Letterman or Leno or any of those shows. Uh, you know, there's a whole crop of new guys today. But, uh, you know, is that fun or is that a pain in the ass to do? Um, I, it's part of the business. You got to do it. I mean, I was on Leno a number of times and, and Letterman as well. Leno was great. I mean, I miss Johnny Carson. He was the last of the really, oh, Leno's probably the last really great ones I want to deal with. The guys today, it's all just, I, I, I don't think there's anybody really great out there for talk show hosts. I really don't. It's kind of sad what's turned into. I, I love what they used to do back then, but I know it's part of the business and uh, I have no problem doing it because, you know, it's, it is a business after all. And you got to sell your product and, you know, the movie is the product and you want people to go see it because you're competing against so many other things. I mean, if you go back in the 60s, even the 70s, there was really only three channels to choose from. Now there's yeah. hundreds of channels to choose from. So it's it's a different beast to uh, get your product to be seen by people. And the, and the tastes out there are just so wide and so varied right now. So, yeah, it's just to me, it's just it's just part of the beast. I got to say one thing real quick, because I know I brought up my book, True Strength, right? Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I wrote one together. There's a follow-up called True Faith. Yeah. She's the better looking one. So it's good to put her on the cover as well. I, I can look at, we're doing a zoom for everybody's listening to this. I can tell you right now, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, they can go to Kevin Sorbo.net. Christmas is coming up guys. And you can autograph copies. I, I got everything on there though. I mean, I got Hercules scripts. I got, I got pictures. I got DVDs. I got so much stuff in Kevin Sorbo.net. Check it out. Christmas is around the corner. No, I appreciate you saying that. I was going to ask you where people can find it. You just did that. And also I want to give you one other plug too, that, you know, this is Kevin's a guy that has, is making himself available in terms of doing podcasts like this, but also out doing public uh, speaking um, that will return. I've actually done uh, a speech in where you live, West Palm. Um, Florida last year, which was fun to do. I'd never been out there before, but you know, people need to be inspired. They need to hear these positive messages. And so for anybody out there, if you're a marketing meeting planner and you need somebody that has been in the public eye, 
has been through some adversity, really knows the struggle. This is your guy. So Kevin, I totally appreciate coming on, making time for this and, uh, you know, just sharing his story. Thank you so much. People go to uh, the official Facebook page of Kevin Sorbel or at K Sorbs on Twitter. I post a lot. I post the truth and I post funny things. So if that offends you, then don't follow me. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. All right, man. Thank you so much. There is the one, the only Kevin Sorbel. Thank you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.